So we open our first scene of the evening within the uh, castle of Vensel Ricard, high on the hill of Pest, on the opposite side of the river. Uh, we're looking deep in the bowels of the castle, in a chamber that is dimly lit with candles and draped with the uh, with the royal arms of the Hungarian family, uh, of the Hungarian royal family, the uh, the Arpads, and we see uh, Bensel Ricard uh, standing before the gathering of the young, uh, well, not young, but the the Canites that were gathered in Hungary to carry out this important task for Lord Jürgen von Verden. And we see flanked at his side, uh, there is Lord Jürgen's Lieutenant Lucretia von Hartz. She was left behind as uh, Wenzel speaks up. This task is of vital importance. Zemitsi, in the dark lands of Carpathia, are of some threat to us. And you can tell, uh, Henrik, that your sire is simply going along with this for the benefit of uh, of his allies. And you can tell that definitely he, he does not want to participate in this. He doesn't want to do this. It's written all over his face. Already your supplies have been arranged. The laborers are being brought together. You will be provided three carriages which are going to be reinforced against the night and sunproofed with resin travel will be dangerous but we do not expect anything serious nothing that five talented young canites could not handle i will give you a moment to speak amongst yourselves and then when you are ready we will depart from the from the audience chamber Lady Lucretia von Hartz, and it, she stiffens sli slightly, and she says, Dame Lucretia von Hartz. And Wenzel bows, he says, forgive me. Dame Lucretia von Hartz is, has been left behind for some time in Budapest to see to Lord Jürgen's affairs, but she will also be here to answer any questions that you might have. She will be uh, awaiting you in the audience chamber. And at that... Uh, Lucretia gives a smart salute before turning to uh, follow Vensel out of the room, leaving for the first time the five young Canites alone in this shadowy chamber with nothing but the dread and ominous task before them looming ahead. So the camera is going to shift to the five of you as you are left in the wake of this uh, revelation and the preparations that must be made. Henrik will smooth out his mustache and thought for a second. And then he turns to the others, giving each one a hawkish stare. He says, as my sire says, this task before us will be dangerous. We needed to work together in this, in all things. I have my own ideas of, on how to proceed, but my ears are open to other suggestions. That's and I just kind of look around, wait for a response. Milo would take one step forward and look at each one of the others before saying, I think it would be, it is hard to talk much more about preparations before we have arrived at our location. I would like to see the location in mind where we are supposed to build this fortress and how much of the ruins are he talked about is are still intact that we can use. Then we can talk about how we can proceed further, at least with what I can contribute. There was a map in the area of, uh, of yes, the there's... area in the room. Uh, correct. There, there is a map that uh, of Hungary and Transylvania. It's a very large painted map. It's actually draped across the uh, the far wall. Hendrik's gonna walk over to the map, and he's gonna point at the pass. This is, of course, where our destination is. 
And then my finger will trace over to uh, Bistritz. This, of course, not but 30 miles away from the pass, is Bistritz. This is the home of one of the Zimitsi lords. This is something that we should be thinking about. The possible danger that this uh, lord could have upon us. Until we are well established in the pass, we will be very vulnerable. Now, from what I understand, we are only going to have between us a handful of retainers, plus a few soldiers that will be provided to us. We need to discuss how we're going to deal with this as a Mitzi Lord when we get there. And I should mention, Soren, that... Uh... Your companion from Chioris, uh, Gervais, he's already left for Magdeburg with uh, Lord Jurgen's uh, retinue, and he was uh, quite unhappy, uh, giving you one last glare before uh, essentially being forced to depart for uh, the Holy Roman Empire. Um, as as um, they speak up and he starts pointing out uh, directions on the map and, and kind of opening it up to the group, Soren's going to Try to try to walk around the table as if he's examining the map. Oh, uh, just to be sure, uh, there. This is a completely different location from the meeting you had with Lord Jurgen. You were in the castle in in, in Pesh now, um, so this is a completely different room. Uh, and and there is a map on the wall. Um, it's it's like a very like I said, very very large map. It's like painted and draped in canvas on the wall. Um, but yeah, you you are in a different location, so we we essentially change scene over. Okay, um, Soren is standing back, looking at the map on the wall, and kind of uh, with his with his arms folded and a few fingers lifted to his lips as he as he kind of ponders their situation and thought. He seems to be examining the map for strategic ways to uh, to try and handle this. The obvious question, Hendrik says, is whether we try to, to establish a relationship with this Dimitri Lord, but based on falsehood, or do we try to, to take him out from the get-go? And if we do go in undercover we need to have our story straight the moment that anyone discovers who we are and what we are doing we will be in very grave danger indeed agreed are you familiar with these lands um, have you been there in person or have you mainly studied and been told about them I have mainly studied and been told about them. All right. Still, good enough. Do you have any knowledge of this particular Tsenitsi Lord? I do not even know. I just know that there is one there, but for some reason I have not been able to discover the exact identity of this, uh, this Lord. That is something that we definitely need to... Uh, discover as soon as possible. Also, their his or her reputation and uh, how they normally deal with threats would be val very valuable information. I agree. I have heard that these Tsimitsi are battling each other almost as much as they are battling Jameer, or battling amongst themselves, rather. Is that true? Maybe we could exploit that if we are to form some sort of relationship with this Tsimitsi Lord. Maybe have him do some of the dirty work for us against some of his companions. I would expect that they are rivals, but if an outside enemy is presented, I would not count on them not uniting against us. Oh yes, like I said, it was only if we were to... Uh, present ourselves as and form some sort of relationship as you as you suggested so you know this better than me so I will defer to your knowledge 
my expertise is more along the military lines. I am extremely open to suggestions uh, for a more diplomatic point of view. The thing of it is, we need to buy ourselves time. It's going to take us at least a couple of years to fully secure this pass. So we need to buy ourselves enough time to consolidate our power and to consolidate the villages in the area. If we show our hand too soon, then this mission is doomed to failure. Yes, I do agree. Do you have any idea as to, you mentioned the cover story, have you had any thoughts on that? <sighs> well, there is a possibility that We can go under the cover of another clan. Or we can paint ourselves as simple independents that has that have nothing to do with the conflict at hand. That seems like the a, a wise approach if if we could get away with it so to speak if we present ourselves as simple a simple coterie that is wanting to claim domain then we will of course have to deal with his Zimitsi lord but we will not have to deal with him necessarily as an enemy at first yes I have not had many or any that matter dealings with Tamitsi personally. Um, I've heard nasty things. As uh, Henrik and Milo discuss uh, before the map with Soren, uh, kind of looking over the map silently, the camera is going to pan to Nikolai and Ebba to see how they're taking in this discussion and, and what's uh, what their thoughts are. So Nikolai was uh, studying the map, trying to think strategic advances did we establish how many how many actual soldiers we would be assigned i think we've been told a number <clears throat> uh correct you will be provided uh five soldiers by oh. lord uh lord jurgen and your sire uh, Vensel, is going to be re providing two or three soldiers of his own so that's not in addition to your own retainers um, and th those are for fighting men. You're also being provided, obviously, laborers and a great deal of money um, and three carriages with, you know, uh, horses and, and supplies to make the journey to Transylvania. Okay. And the trip would take about two weeks. Uh, three. Three weeks. And uh, what time of the year is it? It's going to be, by the time we arrive, it will be spring. Um, yes, you, by the time you arrive, um, winter will have uh, broken. So if we travel during the winter, what kind of uh, difficulties are we going to run into? I mean, is it, is it snowing? Is, is there a lot of snowfall right now? Uh, if you, you know, if you hurry, because uh, it's winter right now, um, but you won't run into any serious problems until you hit the Carpathians. Um, so there's really no point in hurrying the, the journey, because if you if you get into the Carpathian Mountains before winter is broke, then you're going to have serious problems. Um, okay. But the, you know, obviously that this was this was timed fairly well, because uh, winter is expected to break in about three weeks, and that's when you're expected to arrive. Okay. I'm going um, to. Oh, sorry. Um, is there any furniture in this room, or is it just a bare room with the map? Uh, this is an. Uh, this is like a receiving chamber. So there's a. Uh, you know, there's a large, um, dais, a large stone platform leading up to a throne. 
style chair uh, for for the Lord to receive. You know, it's currently empty. For what you expect is Lord Vensel to receive, you know, guests. But other than that, this room is fairly empty. It's lit by candelabra and, and there are tapestries draped on the wall. And then, of course, there's the large map of Hungary and Transylvania, which is opposite to um, opposite to the throne. Um, <clears throat> Ebba is standing uh, slightly ajar behind the throne um, and its threshold, kind of looking over the group, um, kind of in the shadows, listening as everyone talks back and forth. And um, her little figure is just barely visible as she's poking her head out to see everyone and um, looking over towards the map. Her uh, her head is, is slightly tilted to the left and a few pieces of her uh, blonde hair are actually soaked from being uh, sucked upon, which is uh, kind of in the crevice of her lips. Her lips are in a thin line and um, it's actually a habit she had when she was human that, that carried over into her, her afterlife. And uh, she... Just, just standing there quietly, sucking on her hair and kind of chewing on it, her little chin moving back and forth. Um, and she's just taking everything in at the moment. And as she sees Soren and uh, Nikolai kind of studying over the map, uh, she too is looking at the area that um, Hedrick pointed to of where they were going. And though she doesn't say anything, in the back of her mind, uh, she is thinking that... Uh, they won't just be dealing with the Zemitsi, um, for which she has never had any encounters with before. She's heard stories, but she's never uh, dealt with any of the Zemitsi before. Um, but what lies within the wilderness there, she she uh, is quite sure uh, will be just as daunting as the Zemitsi. But she actually doesn't say anything about this for now. Um, the, the, it seems the group's main concern right now is the Zemitsi. Actually, it's kind of funny that you would bring that up, uh, even though Hen even though you didn't say this to Hendrik. Um, one of the things that was on his mind was actually the Gangrel and the Nosferatu. And almost as if reading your mind, uh, Hendrik says, there is more than the Zemitsi we have to worry about. There allied clans, the Gangrel and the Nosferatu, we have to consider as well. And Henrik looks over at Ebba and he says, what can you tell us, if anything, of the Gangrel in this area? Milo would also turn his case to Ebba. Um, as everyone kind of, uh, turns and looks at her, uh, she kind of narrows her hues a bit and just keeps on nibbling her hair. Uh, and she does this for a good 30 seconds, um, kind of contemplating what they're asking her, uh, before finally she speaks up in her, in her kind of soft and, and, and <laughs> little girl voice, uh, to be frank. I have never traveled that far. I don't know what lies within the wilderness there, but I do know not just vampires you have to worry about. You speak, of course, of the werewolves. Um, and as he says that she, um, she doesn't smile, but there is kind of a hint of acknowledgement with this little curve of her lips as she keeps chewing on her hair. Um, and eventually she gives a very slow nod, uh, kind of a haunting nod, actually, um, at the prospect of, of werewolves being in uh, the wilderness that they're going to be traveling to. Henrik uh, looks at Ebba and he says, you will have to be our eyes in the dark forests around us. 
do you think you can establish communications with these gangrel or these wolves? Maybe to help neutralize the threat before it becomes one. Um, as he asks this, she kind of um, tenses her nose a little bit, uh, thinking about it for a moment before finally speaking up. I'm sure the gang girl that lie within these lands will be fine talking to me, but I cannot assume anything. As for the werewolves, and she kind of pauses a moment, werewolves are not friendly to our kind. When they come across Gangrel in the wilderness, let's just say we have a line between us. We know not to cross that line. Henrik just kind of nods his head, uh, nods his head at that. We will deal with it when the time comes. There is uh, a source of information that we do have, of course, and that is the uh, girl, uh, Sherazina. Uh, I think that we should question her. She is actually, after all, a daughter of one of the noble families loyal to the Zemitsi. She may be able to tell us something. The camera is going to pan around to uh, Nikolai and Soren, who seem to be deep in thought. Are there any, uh, like, natural feet on the... Uh, no, that area um, of Transylvania is not well known, but you do know that the uh, area surrounding the Tehuda Pass is... I mean, there, there are villages in the area, but there is no feudal lord there. Uh, the nearest feudal lord is uh, Bistritz. So essentially, these villages are unclaimed, which you know the um, the f the nature of there being no feudal structure in that area probably accounts for how little the map actually uh, can tell you. I'm going to lean over just a little bit to Doran, studying them. Our daylight hours difficult. Indeed, it will take the builders some time to construct our fortress. In the meantime, at this hill, kind of turn around, my lord, if you would permit me to speak. And he's a, he's turned and addressing Henrik. Henrik kind of looks over at him. He says, uh, "You do not need my permission to speak." We are all equals here. You want me? As he bows lightly. All right, hold on. Henrik, make hmm. a conviction roll. <sighs> all right. You've just violated the road of kings. All right, and the difficulty? Um, always eight for conscience and conviction. Yeah, that's a, that's, that's a botch. <laughs> oh, you gotta be fucking kidding me. But you didn't roll, you rolled too much dice. Like, you rolled six dice. It's, it's I not one, two, three, four, five, six. That's how many. It's I not have possible there. for you to have six convictions. Oh, wait, what, what am I? What am I rolling for that? I thought it was by road dice. No, it's it's conviction. Oh, 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 oh. Yeah. So try that one more time. <laughs> You're probably happy to have another throw at that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So as soon as the words leave your mouth, Henrik, you feel a pang yeah. of uh, reproachment for yourself. You know that this. Tremere is the least of the least, and he does not he does not deserve to be treated as an equal, uh, for you are the blood of kings. But nonetheless, the camera does uh swivel around back to Soren. Um he seems uh quite taken aback by uh Henrik's answer, but he seems to smile at the corner of his mouth as he's the answer pleases him and he and he bows you want to make my lord. But I believe you asked about the local Sumitsi. 
I believe I have some information that you might find prudent. Go on. Yeah, and he and he points to Bas- to Bastries. The local Zemitsi lord here claims the title in Transylvania known as the Kinesi. His name is Count Radu. Count Radu. And and just but, as an aside, the pronunciation on that word is Nietzsche. Nietzsche. Can you tell us anything specific about this Count Radu? I know very little about Count Radu. He's claimed this area for some time, though I do know that he is not a military man. He is a diplomat. And if we were to approach him diplomatically as an independent coterie, they would not be suspicious and quite welcoming our presence, though we would have to swear fealty. <laughs> and immediately, uh, to your minds, Henrik and uh, Milo, you know that you, you cannot swear a false oath. That's that's like the most taboo uh, possible thing on the Road of Kings. So the both of you immediately kind of uh, know that that would be very wrong. Yeah, Milo would scoff um, at it as soon as he mentions it. He wouldn't interrupt. Uh, I do look to uh, Milo. Uh, well, first I take in Soren. I say, um, being who you are, you are probably the last one that needs to be in the presence of this uh, Zemitsi lord. If he realizes who you are, there will be no, um, there will be no out for us. Yes, it would be a big gamble. If they were to see through our lies. Yes, it is a difficult situation, to say the least. And having pondered that situation myself, I have another alternative, though would be equally difficult. What is your suggestion? If we assert ourselves as independent canites seeking to, to carve out a fiefdom of our own, it won't warrant a full-blown response from the Zemitsi and their lords, though it would upset, it would upset Count Radu substantially. Yes, I mentioned that earlier. But it is good that you came up with that strategy independently. I do believe that if uh, Milo and I were to approach this Amitsi Lord and uh, negotiate with him, we could buy us some time. Of course, we will swear no oaths of loyalty to him, but we can at least... um, deal with him as uh, independence. Uh, out of character, how much would Milo quote-unquote know about the Tsumitsi, uh, or have heard like rumors and gossip and stuff? Um, if you possess politics, you can roll intelligence politics. All right. Uh, one second I think I, I do have politics yeah, one second you know what since uh, since the idea came out of my mouth uh, may I also roll that what do you uh, want to roll just the same kind of the same thing to see if what I'm saying actually makes sense uh what oh proposing to go visit uh right okay intelligence politics all right so it's I mainly want it because I assume that I've had no actual physical contact with Zemitsi ever, so... I'm yeah, you've never you've never met the Zemitsi. All right. A difficult uh, to six? Correct. Okay. Hendrik kind of looks around. Does anybody have any other suggestions or concerns that they want to voice? I do indeed, my lord. 
At this point, Soren crosses his arms. I would avoid a public meeting with this Radu at all costs. If we go in and claim to be independents, claiming to build our own fortress and take part of our own fiefdom out of his own lands, there is very little reason for him to even let you leave. Uh, go ahead and roll... We're going to pause real quick. Go ahead and roll intelligence uh, politics. Soren. All right, sent you the results of that. Soren brings a, a finger to his mouth as he turns and to look at the map one more time. On the other hand, if Count Radu has been holding this fiefdom for hundreds, hundred years at least, if you offered an audience with him under a banner of parley, it's unlikely he would violate such a thing. Yes, I have heard that they adhere to a very strict code. And can be quite hospitable, as long as you don't step on any of their many toes. Then it's decided. Once we get to the pass, we will send a diplomatic envoy to this the Mitzi Lord Radu. But on to more immediate concerns. I would like to, um, and I kind of turn over to Milo. You displayed interest in the girl. Do you still have interest in her? Indeed. Milo just smiles. I believe that you may get more information out of her than I. I would certainly be very happy to make an attempt. We need to find out exactly uh, how important this girl is to her family. And as well as what, if anything, she knows of the Zabitsi themselves. Maybe nothing, maybe something. We also need to I figure guess. out what kind of uh, political um, leverage she could provide us. Very well. Uh, just out of character quickly, have Milo, Milo been informed about who this girl is? Because, at, like, in the meantime? Because uh, I'm not sure, I mean, he never knew. Who he yeah, is, she, who she she did. Was. Yeah, yeah. Everyone knows that she's she's a Bazarab. All right. Well, then he will just agree to it. Yeah. If uh, I'm gonna kind of just look at around at everybody else, and if nobody else has, looks like they want or need to say anything else. I kind I just kind of look over at uh, Milo and I say uh, let us go speak with this girl uh, before we go I had one more in uh, I had one more thought and he, Milo would look over to Eva the young lady didn't seem to swear any oath the night the rest of us did what are your interests why are you doing this going along with this sorry um as soon as milo uh speak says this um ebba would kind of round her eyes over to him and she would speak up uh rather quickly i've already sworn my oath I'm dedicated to their service for a hundred years, she says. Very well. I mean, no offense. Um, and as he says that, she kind of lifts her chin kind of indignantly. Um, but she says nothing further on the matter. My All right, so you, um, you wanted to bring in Sherazina? Yes. Okay. Just just as an aside for the you know the formality of the day, um, 
you know, you you would not go to her. You would send someone to fetch her and bring her to you, um, because you're the Lord in this situation. Mm -hmm. Then um, I will. Oh, is where is my uh, squire? Uh, your squire is posted just outside. I call out to him. Boy. After a moment, Orlin comes through the archway and you see him um, looking at you with uh, slightly wide eyes. Go bring that girl to us. Share the... I be prompt about it. He nods and uh, turns to um, briskly leave, uh, keeping enough decorum not to run through the castle. It's if only a few minutes later until Sherajina emerges, still dressed in that um, that torn gown and uh, looking disheveled uh, and more than a little bit frightened. As uh, your squire, uh, Orlin, leads her over to you, she, he, he releases her arm and she immediately uh, collapses to her knees in front of you, uh, looking down at the ground, kind of her her long hanks of dark hair hanging in her lovely face. I kind of, you know, look over at Milo and I just kind of, you know, my eyes go from him to her, you know, as if. Yeah, Milo would. Do, sorry, it. I was muted. Uh, sorry, I didn't press down the button. <laughs> Milo, as soon as Olin uh, lets go of her and she drops to the ground, Milo would uh, go step over to her and and pick her up firmly, but very gently as well. Oh, no, come. Don't stay down there in the in the dirt. Let's go somewhere more comfortable. And all of a sudden, her eyes go wide and she recoils from you as you say that, as if uh, terrified what you might do to her. All right. Uh, can I use presence here? With presence? Yeah, in a suit, like, to soothe her? Make her trust me? Or it might. Me, at least. Go ahead and spend a blood point and roll uh, Charisma Performance, difficulty 7. Unfortunately, the power of your blood, though it does roll forward, it doesn't seem to um, have this uh, same level of potency, or at least it doesn't, it, it isn't enough to overwhelm her, uh, as clearly she is quite frightened to be in this situation. She's, she's not ignorant of where she is or who you are um, as she looks around. Please... Please, I, I, I beg you, just just send me back to my family, and they they will give you, they will give you a reward. I, I, I... she begins breaking down and, and sobbing, um, though trying hard not to, uh, not to do so in front of you. Um, Henry kind of reaches over and uh, takes the girl by the shoulder with a firm hand, and he forces her to look in his eyes, and he. Uh, uses uh, Mesmerize on her. All right, go ahead and describe uh, you doing that uh, after you make the roll. All right, let me see. Milo would kind of bite his lip, annoyed at that he was a bit too eager, still, still compelled by her, yeah, beauty. Is she crying right now? Yep, she's weeping. Go ahead and uh, describe what you do as you look into her eyes. I tell, I say, uh, hush, child. You will speak calmly you will tell this man everything that you know you will answer all his questions do you understand you can tell that it is uh, a very weak impression that you've left upon her uh, she must either be uh, very strong-willed or uh, something happened but she's she does nonetheless nod very slowly as if in a dream I, my lord, I. Okay. I take my hand away from her, and I just step back. Then I look over at Milo, and I just, you know, just nod my head. Sorry, could you repeat that again? I just look over at Milo and nod my head as if to proceed. Shirazina stands there as if in a daze. All right, Milo would look for... Was there any furniture to sit on? No. 
No, that wasn't even true. Only, for, the only the chair for the Lord, and you know, only the Lord sits in this room. Oh yes. He would look at her again. He would take her hands and bring her attention to to him again. Nobody's gonna hurt you. Just be still. Be <laughs> be quiet. Um, uh, sorry to interrupt you, Milo, but, uh, can I just say that as this is going on, Abba is watching, uh, everyone just kind of <laughs> worrying themselves over this woman and, uh, immediately the, the kind of the hair that's in her mouth kind of slips from her lips and the saliva just kind of goes all down the side of her cheek as she's watching this and you don't uh, have saliva. Well, just kidding. Not the saliva, but <laughs> whatever. And, uh, She's just watching this, and um, she finds this quite ridiculous, uh, them trying to attempt to calm her. Um, if, if it had gone on any longer, she probably would have gone over there and yelled at her to stop crying. Well, luckily, she stopped crying then. <laughs> Child, so, what do you know about the, the, the canines of this area? Kerosina blinks, as if in a dream. I know that there are dark lords that ride by night, and my father answers to them. He, they, they protect us. They give us wealth, and they ensure our, our, our people are safe from the night folk. So you has, your father has sworn fealty to the lords of the land. The Dark Lords. Yes. As is all who rule in Transylvania. Have you ever met with this lord? In person? Or merely never. seen him? No, never. And she gets visible fear across her lovely face. There, there. You're safe here. Nobody's gonna hurt you. Do not worry. Do you do you know the name of the lord your family has sworn allegiance to? What name does he go by? She goes white and actually uh, shakes her head um, as if uh, quite afraid. Alright. Easy now, easy now. Just a few more questions. Do you know where he resides? This lord. Have you heard any rumors? No, 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 I I I, I know he has a castle somewhere. A stronghold in the wilderness. I I, I don't know where. Alright. Milo looks to Henrik as if is there anything more we could get out of her right now? Ask her how powerful her family is. How influential it, uh, is her family? Milo nods and turns back to the, the girl. What station does your family hold in these lands? My, Are you close to the Lord? Your family, my, I mean. my f family, my family are... Are, and she's speaking haltingly as you can see the dominate is actually forcing her to speak although it's, it's it is a weak impression so she's you do have to wait before she finally gets out Milo looks at her patiently while she my, my family uh, are the Bazarab we we are one of the families that the peasantry want us to be their rulers my father says he will be a king someday. But my brother... He shakes her head. He is mad. He desires to, to be one of the lords, one of the hidden lords. A Dragomir. My would look a bit 
not worry, a, a tiny bit, with a little bit of worry in his eyes at Henry, quickly, and as she mentions this, your brother, do you know if he has had any contact with the Lord or any of his kind? Because I am told it is so. Practice. And what was the word that she uh, said that her brother was trying to become? Essentially, um, a Dragomir, uh, her brother, you know, his name is Dragomir, apparently, um, wants to essentially become a vampire. That, that's your impression. He, he wants to join the Zemitsi. Okay, that's what I thought. She, I just the word she used was one of the Dark Lords. Was the word yeah, she, she also described him as half mad. Right. It, it was... It was... Dragomir that I was wanting to make sure I heard. Okay, yeah, that that seems to be his name, judging from the context. Thank you. Ask her exactly where her family family's holdings are located. Where does your family reside? Where are your main holdings? Where do you live? We have many keeps, but in the south. Point on the map. Milo would escort her over, and firmly but gently over to the map. At your command, you see that she uh, points her finger in the south of Transylvania, which is uh, just beyond the, uh, like the apron of the Carpathian Range. Uh, you see that the lands appear to be Valicia. How is it compared to? Uh, uh, in comparison to like where we are, and, like oh, where you are is in exactly. the northern end of Transylvania, the the um, the streets and the uh, Tehuda Pass are are to the northern end of the ranges. Oh yeah, sorry, I just misunderstood. I just heard it wrong when you said that the other was at the south. I know where the yeah Tehuda Pass is and stuff. Okay, yeah, sorry. It would take some time to get word to her family. In any, at any rate. What holdings do you have here in the north? Do your you family have any any residences or any close contacts? She shakes her head. Henry kind of looks over at um, Milo and he says, I believe we have what information we can from this girl at the, for the moment. Yes, I agree. Milo still just looks at her, caressing her hair very gently. He seems to be still very, very captivated by, by this girl. Not entranced, but still very, very... Indeed, as you look at her, your thirst almost rises instinctively. Uh, you're, you, you feel yourself desiring to possess her. Uh, Milo would turn to, to Henry. Do you think we should bring her with us? She potentially will make a valuable hostage. Yes. And she, and we can assume that she at least knows somewhat of the lands of her around the area. So she might come in handy in that. So I think she would be a liability. I wouldn't want to have to keep her chained up by anything vulgar like that. We will take precautions before we head out to make sure she uh, she does not do that. Oh, naturally for the travels, of course, of course. I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of uh, take Milo aside, you know, kind of a little private conversation. Milo would follow. I I cannot help but notice your lingering gaze upon this young mortal. Oh, you know, the curses of the blood and all that. He just gives Henrik a smirk. At this moment, I paid good coin for her, so she is my possession. But gift her to you. Oh, that is very, very, very kind of you, sir. 
I would be happy to reimburse you whatever expenditure you you had. My re my reimbursement, of course, will be the exchange of a future boon. Milo would look into the air a bit thoughtfully. Then he would look back to heaven. Well, seem, since, seem, since we are to be partners, Companions for a while. Uh, I'll take you up on that offer. Agreed. He will shake his stick, uh, present his hand to Henrik. Henrik, uh, um, Henrik. Uh, hold on. The, the customs of the day indicate that um, an arm clasp is only a military uh, greeting among fellow brethren. They don't shake hands otherwise in this day and age. Okay, okay. sorry. All right. Then we just this. nod at each other. The, yes. girl, the girl is now your responsibility. Um, as they're uh, making this deal with one another, Eva has already kind of uh, rounded the outskirts of the room, and she's making her way to the door, uh, uh, hopefully to uh, meet Lucretia, I believe. And as Eva turns to leave, the camera pans to Soren and Nikolai, who are sort of left kind of standing with each other. Soren again appears to be lost in thought as he um, seems to be repeating softly under his breath some of the words that the girl had spoke. Uh, it seems he's he's thinking about what she had said. And you see that Nikolai is uh, praying over the girl. Sherazina stands there kind of in a daze. When Milo comes back to name property, uh, Nikolai will turn to him. I trust that it will unwanted. Can I call it the embrace? Um, you you're referring to turning a human into a canine? Yeah. Yeah, that's that's how you would refer to it. Milo would look with a bit of surprise at Nikolai. This. I can assure you, there won't. I have no interest or desire in in embracing this young child. At least not yet, and certainly not while we're on on our current assignment. So, no, I can assure you of that. Very good. Milo just looks a bit, a tiny bit annoyed and confused. The camera is going to follow uh, Ebba. She walks out into the um, into the audience chamber, and uh, you see as you, you go out there, Ebba, that uh, Lucretia is standing at attention, uh, waiting for the you know the others to finish their discussion inside. She glances at you with those uh, cold blue eyes of hers as you walk in. You see her her pale face and um, her fierce countenance. As Ebba walks into this new chamber uh, solemnly and and without her uh, her newfound comrades, um, she kind of actually makes a, a, a slow and uh, kind of distinct walk towards uh, Lucretia, and uh, her hands are behind her back, her her little fingers entwined with one another, and um, eventually she stops a few paces away from her and just stares up at her. Um, but says nothing. She's silent. Um, and she's kind of studying uh, Lucretia's demeanor and, and uh, her, I mean, just her overall uh, air is quite impressive. I mean, as far as Ebba's concerned, she finds her quite fascinating. <clears throat> but she doesn't say anything for the moment and waits for the others to follow. Lucretia is a curiosity um, in her in her time. I mean, she's a she's a woman warrior. That's that's something you almost hardly ever see in this day and age, uh, especially one so so fearsome looking. She's dressed in full armor, and um, although you know the rules can be a little different for canites, certainly, uh, but she she does not look away from your gaze. In fact, you simply stare at each other as she away. She she actually doesn't say anything uh, as she meets your stare. And this would go on for probably a minute before Ebba would finally speak. 
kind of in a curious tone. Are you a warrior? She says. Lucretia's back stiffens with pride almost imperceptibly as she nods. I am. I'm Gross Comptor of the Knights of the Black Cross. You don't recognize the word that she used, Gross Comptor. She, in, as you say that, she indeed does not recognize it, and uh, almost immediately afterwards she says, What does that mean? She pauses for a second before translating it into Hungarian as best she can. Grand Master. As she says this, Ebba kind of raises a brow, um, thinking on, on the, the words for a moment before speaking again. And what does a Grand Master do? Pray you never find out. <laughs> as she says that, uh, Ebba kind of smiles slightly and just stares up at her. Uh, she finds it kind of amusing, actually. All right. And with that, I think we're ready to um, end the scene for now, unless anyone has any uh, further dialogue or anything to raise or anything else they'd like to do. Other than other than, I'm thinking about maybe going to feed. All right. So with that, that we're going to uh, end the scene. And let's transition into a, sort of an out-of-character discussion, a recap of what everyone's going to do as we prepare to depart. Um, you know it will take about three weeks to get to, um, get to Transylvania, particularly the Tehuda Pass. So... Um, we're just going to go around and cover everyone's uh, preparations. But before we do, uh, I'd like to say that you do meet Miklos. And uh, as, you, as you gather for the, uh, the departure, Miklos apparently is uh, some kind of retainer to, uh, to Henrik. He is a, you know, a skilled blacksmith of some kind. And you can tell that he's a craftsman, a broad, sturdy man that has, you know, arms as thick as the trunks of young trees and hands calloused from years at working the forge. Um, he speaks very little, and uh, but he works hard, you know, loading the the crates into the uh, back of the carriages and the shuttered the, the shuttered carriages themselves and the wagons to follow are loaded down with goods and. Uh, Miklos is almost naturally commanding the way he uh, organizes the laborers, and you can tell almost right away that he seems to have asserted himself as uh, some sort of a, a makeshift foreman. But as we prepare to depart, um, let's start with Soren. Uh, Soren, what do you do in probably... You've got maybe a few hours before the, uh, the carriage intends to leave Budapest. Uh, can you come back to me? Yeah, sure. We'll move right along to Nikolai. What kind of, um, let's say, like, church? You do know that there is a, um, there's a cathedral in uh, Budapest. You don't know about any orphanages. You don't know the city that well. Um, but you do see that there are children, you know, running around in the streets. Late at night? Yes, which is quite surprising. Yeah, he's just going to wander around if he has time to... Make sure that no one's causing trouble for the. To your surprise, Nikolai, as you get closer to the cathedral, um, which is, uh, you know, a, one of the one of the greater edifices in Budapest, it kind of towers over the the thatch and and wattle and daub houses that line the streets, which are crooked and winding. You feel a sudden prickling on your skin, uh, a burning sensation, which grows exponentially greater the closer you get to the cathedral. Oh. You've never quite felt this sensation before. I will I will change my direction of travel where it's coming from. It is coming from the cathedral then I You almost instinctively know that it is radiating from the cathedral. In fact your beast recoils a little as you look at the edifice. Um, and your skin seems to prickle, and, and it, it, as you walk closer, and you're probably only 100 yards from the cathedral now, but as you walk closer, the prickling on your skin becomes like hot needles on the surface of your skin, and it grows even greater, should you choose to approach even further. No, I think I'm going to 
turn back, going with my plan B. Yeah, you, you make a, a quick cursory scan of the urchins that are in the streets of Budapest, but they appear to be uh, fairly um, fairly well left alone. You don't you don't see any of them on the auction block or anything. So that's probably going to take up at least a couple of hours. Okay. Are there any other preparations you'd like to make before leaving? Other than uh, making sure my horse is brought with. Okay. Yeah, there's, there's definitely feed for your horse and the caravan that's getting ready to uh, load up appears to be in full swing as we uh, go to Milo. Milo would mainly be concerned with introducing Cherasina to Zorain, explaining to her that she is going to serve as her handmaiden for the time, as her new handmaiden for the time being, and that uh, Milo expects her to help keep an eye on her, especially during the the daylight hours, so she might have to sleep at a bit different hours than she's used to. Oh, you needn't be concerned for Lorraine at all. Her trust for you is is absolute, and the blood bond is strong on top of that. Uh, she uh, seems happy, pleased to have a handmaiden, although she uh, is displeased with how Sherazina is dressed and uh, lends her one of her dresses. Um, she doesn't want a handmaiden looking so shabby. But other than that, uh, there doesn't seem to be any sort of jealousy, uh, at least... Nothing right, that you good. you feared. All right, and I will also explain to her uh, the situation. Obviously, that this young girl is is, is scared, and again, I'm, I will I, I depend on Lorraine to to help uh, get her to trust us. You know, at least know that we won't hurt her, so she's not going to try anything stupid. Lorraine reassures you that she will do everything she can. All right. Other than that, uh, he will. He will inquire as if there is, if they can get something, a, a snack before leaving, so to speak. Yeah, you can go hunting, sure. What does the area? Yeah, I will leave the the, the ladies to to do their thing. Leave the rain to dress up and get to know Sherasina, uh, and I will go. I guess I will go and look around the city first of all. To see if there is any opportunities that springs springs to his eyes right away. Okay, how do you intend to hunt? Are you just gonna grab someone off the street? Or are you gonna um, you know, what's your what's your plan? Oh, he's just gonna try and not completely woo a girl, but uh, find find a uh, a young lady if he can and use her his charms on her. And All right. That. He's hungry, but he's he's not. Well, it is fairly late at night, and Budapest uh, does not have you know the, the highest population. So go ahead and roll uh, wits alertness, difficulty seven, as you walk the streets of the city. See if you find anything. Sure enough, after some time, uh, it doesn't take you long before you find yourself in a, a shabbier part of uh, Pest. Or I'm sorry, Buda, on the other side of the river, where they're. Um, they're a collection of sort of uh, haggard-looking uh, women. They're they're not great beauties or anything, but they they do appear to be uh, sort of worn slatterns that are prostituting themselves in the streets and calling out to passers-by, and, and they call out to you as well as you walk by. He will look them over for a short second and decide on the one that he finds most physically attractive. Yeah, these women are, are nothing near the standard to which you are you are used to in France. Um, they're clearly, uh, some of their teeth are missing. Uh, they're a bit older. And uh, although they do make sort of lewd promises to you as uh, you do proposition one of them and manage to isolate her away from the others. Do you still want to just narrate it or do you want to go into the character? Oh yeah, just go ahead and describe what happens as you isolate her real quick. All right. Well, he will just sweet talk her and lean into, lean into, start kissing her neck, and if she, if she mentions anything about payment or anything, he will, he will give her, he will pay her. I mean, I assume it's he, she is not asking much. I assume. She doesn't say anything about payment as you begin kissing her. All right, all right. Uh, but he will, he will 
just normally kiss her for about 10 seconds, kind of caressing her body, and then he will apply the kiss and start start drinking from her neck. All right. How much do you intend to take? He will just intend to take two, if he can settle himself for that. Yeah, yeah, you're 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 comfortably well fed. I mean, you, there's no danger of the beast uh, taking over as you feed from her, and uh, it isn't long before she slumps against you, still bleeding uh, from her neck. He likes to uh, to close the wound, of course, and leaves her in as comfortable a, a position as possible. All right, Possibly. striding out of the alleyway. Is there anything else you'd like to do? I do not think so. No, he will be pretty focused on on the journey on the journey ahead. Uh, and and their new companion okay. that he also has to keep in mind. So yeah, no, he will just he will return to the to the ladies and uh, and yeah, otherwise just make preparations to make sure that everything is packed and yeah, all their possessions are being brought along. And as Milo departs for the caravan, we're going to shift to Henrik. Henrik, uh, what preparations would you like to make before you leave? First off, I will check upon my steed and make sure that he is uh, has been well taken care of. Um, once I do that, uh, I'll, obviously my retainers are uh, packing up everything. After, uh, well, so everyone except Kettlewick. Kettlewick right. seems to be cavorting around and getting in everyone's way. There we go. Um, then I'm going to visit my herd which I have uh, two dots in. Um, I am envisioning my herd as just my basic household staff, like my maids, you know, people that um, they don't provide any other um, benefit other than they're part of my household. And okay. they've, all spoken, they've all spoken oaths of loyalty to me. So I approach one of the maids as she is uh, uh, packing up belongings. And I tell her, come. Your maid follows after you. And I just kind of, uh, you know, kind of take her by the neck and kind of give her a look in the eye. And then I plunge my things into her neck very unceremoniously. Uncere she sighs and submits happily to the kiss. This is not the first time you've fed from her. All right. And I just take two from her. All right. You do leave her groggy, but you think she will still be able to fulfill her duties after you're finished. Okay. I lick my lips and I tell her to continue on. And then um, uh, once I do that, um, I do. I'll do this later because it's not it's not important right now. But I do want to kind of discuss uh, Kettlewick's future future role because obviously I'm taking him out of this court, and I want to um, figure out how to utilize him in the near future. Okay, but I'll save that. I'll save that for uh, for later. All right. Is there anything else? Just basically general preparedness, um, uh, packing packing things up, or seeing other people make sure they do everything right, and and we're and we're supposed to leave what the next night. Uh, you, well, you know, you you were scheduled to leave that night. Oh, that night. Yeah. Then I and think the... it would be. I would want to go speak to my sire, Prince Vensel. Okay. So you and... find Vensel in his uh, in his castle in his uh, study, because um, you know he is a, a fan of, of literature and books. He's a he's a learned man, um, and he. He doesn't rise when you enter, but he does uh, pause for a moment to look up from his book and uh, look at you. 
I give him a uh, give him a bow. He nods. And I say, and I say, my prince, my sire. Your so sire, he, but no longer your prince. You serve me no longer. You are prince of this city. Indeed, and even I could not stop that German from tearing my child from my own hands. I did not want to leave on such a sour note. I wanted you to know that though we are now taking different paths, I shall always be your child. Indeed you will be, Henrik. I will call upon you before long. And I give him another bow and I say, uh, I wish you many fair nights ahead. Vensel has a, an inscrutable expression upon his cold features, but he does not. And, I... with, and with those words, I turn to leave. Vensel allows you to go. Uh, you wonder if he'll say any, any one last thing to you, but he does not. And as you depart, uh, you find yourself in the wake of a freedom you've never known. Yes, it's basically, it feels like a, uh, a weight has lifted on my shoulder, off my shoulders. But at the same time, the, you know, you can't help, he can't help but wonder about the future. After all, he's leaving the um, safety of his sire and these walls that have protected him for basically a hundred years. He's never ventured uh, so far beyond civilization as he has now. Though he has, of course, battled, you know, bandits and other threats um, barely within a day's uh, night's ride of the city. Um, the future looks bright but hazy as he continues uh, walking away. All right. Is there anything else Henrik would like to do? Nope, that's it. Okay, so with that, we'll switch over to Ebba. Ebba, what sort of preparations are you uh, going to make for leaving? Ebba doesn't really have much to do. <clears throat> um, she's a, a young girl with little need of many things in life. So uh, she, well, before I go on, uh, this the city that we're in currently uh it's, I'm, I'm assuming there's a wall around it. How, how easily do people go in and out of the city? Walk out? Uh, no, the gates are shuttered for tonight. Well, in that case, um, she would probably use her protean uh, to shift uh, into her animal form, which is a crow. All right, go ahead and describe it. What are we seeing as Ebba walks the streets of Budapest? If anyone were to see her uh, using this ability, they would see um, her body uh, just, it, it's almost unbelievably, un, like unfathomable to see her turn into this crow, but her body just, just inwardly um, just swoops into itself and then immediately it just bursts forward and she flies up into the sky. Um, with her black wings and her black eyes, and she soars through uh, the darkness, flying over the city, and she is going to land um, not too far away from the wall, uh, and she's going to land in the wilderness, <clears throat> and she's going to change back into herself, uh, and she's going to call upon Varg, who is probably nearby somewhere. All right, so your flight will cost you a blood point uh, for the transformation. But as you uh, summon Varg, he, it, it isn't long at all. It's a minute before he comes loping out of the darkness. As soon as she sees him, uh, this very kind of cherubic smile crosses her face. And um, she, she, she kind of hones in on him and, and wraps her arms around his neck. His, I mean, his big burly neck for that matter, because he's so huge. 
um, and she snuggles into him just almost like another wolf would. Uh, and they have a, a, a kind of a content moment for a moment or two before eventually she would look at him and she'd kind of hold his, his face in her hands and uh, she would speak to him in wolf uh, and ask him if he is hungry. As you bury yourself into Varg's uh, coat, it smells of earth and twigs and, and the local uh, wild. But as he, uh, as you look into his eyes and, and communicate to him in yips and barks, he gives a, a low growl and a, and, and a yip, um, his, his jaw kind of dropping open, panting, and you smell the, uh, the acrid, sweet taste of, of blood in the air as he does so. And, and clearly he is already hunted while you were away. Um, as soon as the whiff of blood kind of hits her, uh, she smiles brightly and kind of nuzzles his nose again and, and coos at him. Um, it, it's, a, it's a, a rather intimate moment, um, kind of heartwarming in a way, uh, as heartwarming as a vampire could be with a ghouled wolf in her arms. Uh, but... It's quite clear that she's content and she's happy that he uh, found food and he's safe. Um, and uh, uh, would she be aware if he needs any more blood from her? Sense that, or I mean, he he doesn't seem to be uh, eager to drink more of your your blood unless offered, and you can usually tell when he when you need to feed him more that he, you know, from his, from the way he nuzzles you and nips at you, um, he's not doing so, but you can always feed him more blood. Okay. Uh, well, in that case, um, she sees that he seems to be, uh, pretty content. Uh, and how much time does she have before sunrise? A few hours. The caravan plans to depart sometime before sunrise. All right. Well, uh, she's probably going to spend spend the rest of the time with him, and actually, she'll wait until the carriage leaves the city to to hitch a ride. Um, she she's not one to stay in the city for very long if she doesn't need to. So she's going to actually. Um, spend time with Varg and uh, just kind of roam about the city and uh, roam about the wilderness around the city for the most part until everyone is ready to leave. Okay, paint a picture for us. What are we, uh, what are we seeing as Ebba spends the next few hours uh, in the wild? Oh, she's totally in her element. She's running, um, running, her and Varg are running. They're... Um, <laughs> they're playing i mean she she's kind of rolling around with him wrestling him um uh it's it's quite childlike in a way but um this is all she knows i mean she, this is her best friend and um she just feels so in her element and actually it, it would seem like oh how, how can she do this for several hours but i mean the time goes by quickly for her all right, and with that, we're going to switch over to Soren to see what preparations he makes. Soren is focused on blood at the moment. He seems concerned about the the journey yeah. and uh, their provisions that they'll be needing over the next three weeks. Are are the Ventru uh, or the the caravan and the squires or something loading up? preparations and like stockpiles like casks of blood um no there's no blood being uh brought along you you do uh it's as it's as if though they there's no there's no provisions of blood being brought okay he's actually gonna gonna seek out henrik and this seems to be uh, important enough that he that he wants to bring it up to henrik um he's gonna try and, and find henrik and ask him about um, maybe possibly bringing along provisions for the, the rest of the coterie. All right, so you meet Henrik um, at the carriage um, 
at the carriage like caravan supply line as everyone is running around uh, trying to load up and, and do their work. I look at this is Soren, right? Soren. Correct. As he comes up to me and I uh, give him a hard look and I wait for him to ask whatever it is he wants to ask. My lord, it's wonderful I have found you. Um, are we bringing along provisions for the rest of us? Three weeks is a great deal of travel time. Do you mean am I to feed you? All of us. Yes, indeed. Or is this something we should take upon ourselves? I did not take upon the responsibility to provide a sustenance to anyone. I would highly suggest that you either find some mortals to string along behind us, but if you should find yourself in a position that you are without sustenance, you may approach me upon this subject, but know that uh, you will owe me if you do so. For I will have to dip into my own larder to feed you. Of course. He kind of smiles and, and bows before Henrik as he turns away. His face quickly turns to a scowl as he got a very ventru answer. And he had thought that they had he was a, a bit closer to Henrik than, than that. So he he wanders off and um, his his priority now is is to feed himself. All right. How do you intend to hunt? Um, he's looking for any type of easy prey, prostitutes, drunkards, um, that he can kind of lead off into um, seclusion, so that he can be uh, alone. All right. Go ahead and roll uh, wits alertness because you're not so picky. You're not looking for any specific sort of person. Uh, the difficulty will be five. It isn't actually long at all before you see a, a drunken, bearded man. It appears to be a, a brigand of some kind. He has a, a sturdy, um, pitted old axe slung at his side, and um, he's you know got a, um, a great burly chest, and he he belches thickly as he stumbles out of the uh, nearby inn. Uh, which is getting ready to close its doors uh, at this time of night. And he's he looks to be the brigand type? Yeah. Uh, basically what this role uh, indicates is that you've found someone that you can quickly subdue, so there are no further roles required. You can just go ahead and describe it. Okay. Um, as as he walks, walks forward, and he, he, he sort of follows the drunken man as he begins stumbling and um, kind of tripping over himself, his shoulders uh, catching his, the weight of his body as he as he stumbles again up against the walls of buildings, and he, before he pushes himself off, Soren is is right at his side, and in a, in one quick and swift motion, he grabs the man from underneath his jaw, cricks his neck to the side, and quickly bites down. Um, to administer the kiss as he as he follows this this drunken man to the floor and begins to feed. How much do you intend to take from him, Soren? Until he is full. All right. So you drain the man. Uh, well, more or less, you completely drain him, and uh, very little mercy or hesitation. You leave a um, a nearly bloodless corpse in an alleyway in Budapest. And he licks the wound closed as he takes out a dagger and it's it's a very sacrificial and or, ornate looking dagger the blade is the blade is curved somewhat as it's as it kind of curves windingly up to a very sharp needle point as he as he looks around to make sure that no one else is around and he sticks the man's side opening a wound and then he pulls out the blade. Not much blood left on it, 
as he's drained the corpse almost completely. He'll lick whatsoever's left of the blood on the blade before putting it back into his belt and then walking off, feeling satisfied that he's secured the resource that he needs. All right, is there anything else Soren would like to do? Um, Soren is actually going to go and talk to uh, Miklos. Um, he's He wants to talk to him and see if he can't provision um, a few leather satchels, uh, small little bundles of crossbow bolts. Miklos finds your request odd, um, and he... He kind of he he asks you uh, if you if you you know work for for if you're one of Lord Henrik's subjects uh, he doesn't recognize you. He explains to him that indeed he he is um, one of one of uh, Henrik's uh, subjects and that he serves Henrik um, and that he'll need this for the coming journey. All right, manipulation subterfuge difficulty seven. He listens to you for a moment and seems to buy your story despite his initial suspicion, but he tells you that he he hasn't prepared um, such weapons and uh, he, he he doesn't have any crossbow bolts to offer you at this time, although he, he could make some if he was given the materials and time to do so. Well, he, he would then ask us um, what he would need to make such a thing. He tells you steel, a forge, or no, iron, because steel hasn't been invented yet. Um, iron, a forge, and shafts and some time. Okay. Does he indicate that he, he would have enough time to do so before we leave? No, the, the impression you get from uh, Miklos is he's kind of annoyed that you're bothering him because he's very busy. Soren would uh, kind of smile and nod and just kind of just kind of agree um, and kind of bow out agreeing that you know he's, he is bothering the man and he's busy. Um, so annoyed, Soren will continue about his the rest of his time reading um, any any books that possibly the the venture would allow him to use uh, about to learn more about Transylvania and the the politics of the area. The yeah, b- books are very expensive in yeah. this time. They're extremely valuable, and, and perhaps your character takes that for granted, having spent so much time in Chioris, because uh, there's no one around here that's going to let you take a book. You could recline in um, the the castle that um, that Lord Vensel uses, Prince Vensel uses, and ask to use some of his books if you want. No, Soren, Soren doesn't find it important enough to bother the prince. Um, He's already had lots of uh, negative uh, interaction and he doesn't want to press his luck any further. Mm -hmm. So Soren is going to spend the rest of his time um, kind of jotting down notes and and taking care of his own affairs as he ponders things that that have happened so far and and possible ways that they could uh, press forward. All right. So with that, Soren is finished with his uh, his preparations. Okay, excellent, guys. So uh, with that, your characters are going to be able to depart Budapest for Transylvania.